Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be terminal unit selection. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. I'll be joined later by Trenton Yarborough and Steve Attree for the question and answer portion of today's program. Trenton is our Director of Engineering and Product Development and formerly the Product Manager for all Titus Terminal Units. Steve is our current Terminal Unit Product Manager. Today we'll cover the general guidelines that should be observed when sizing and selecting terminal units. We'll also look at the various options that are available and how they impact product performance. Although we will use Titus Team's software to make our selections, we won't cover the actual use of our software. We're only using it here to demonstrate how manufacturer software tools can be used to simplify the selection process. The most basic terminal unit is the single duct. It's commonly referred to as a VAV box or shutoff box. It typically receives its supply air from a VAV air handler. A variable frequency drive controls the air handler to maintain a static pressure measured two-thirds or three-quarters of the way down the longest duct run. Single ducts can provide either variable volume or constant air volume depending on the way the flow limits have been set at the box controller. If an air handler only supplies cooling, then interior zones will use cooling only units while the perimeter zones will, would most likely use some sort of heat. In this situation, any heat located at the box would be reheat. The box controls could also be used to operate auxiliary heat, such as a fin tube heater or a radiant panel. When there's heat in the air handler, it may be necessary to provide auto changeover controls so that the box can reverse its operation to provide both VAV heating and VAV cooling. Most of the single duct boxes, regardless of manufacturer, use the same round inlet and rectangular outlet configuration. This type of design reduces the inlet pressure requirement due to the static pressure regain that occurs when the air expands to fill the rectangular cabinet. The only real differences that distinguish between most manufacturers are lining options and inlet sensors on these types of boxes. Multipoint center averaging sensors are preferred because they can provide improved accuracy with poor inlet conditions. Although single duct boxes have very low pressure requirements, the addition of reheat coils, especially multi-row water coils, can result in inlet pressure requirements as high as one and a half inches of water. Single ducts are also often used as exhaust boxes in critical environment applications like laboratories and clean rooms. While the supply air is usually handled by constant volume boxes with reheat coils, the exhaust air often must be controlled to maintain either a positive or negative pressure in the room. Positive room pressure can prevent contaminants from entering a room, while negative room pressure can prevent contaminants from leaving a room. Unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion about exhaust boxes. Many engineers mistakenly select the same type of box that they would use for a supply. The round inlet with rectangular outlet configuration that provides static pressure regain in the supply mode works against the exhaust fan and therefore increases the pressure requirements. Even worse, many installing contractors have mistakenly installed supply boxes backwards thinking that the box must be flipped to work as an exhaust. All of these problems can be avoided by either selecting a purpose-built exhaust box or using a retrofit air valve with a round inlet and a round outlet. It should be noted that currently there's no industry standard for testing or rating exhaust box performance, but luckily ASHRAE Standard 130 and AHRI standard 880 will soon be revised and expanded to cover exhaust boxes. So let's look at the basics of sizing boxes. My rule of thumb for sizing inlet ducts, especially for VAV applications, is to select for a maximum inlet velocity as close to 2,000 feet per minute as possible. I know that if I don't exceed 2,000 feet per minute, I shouldn't self-generate noise in the supply duct work. I also know that 2,000 feet per minute will keep my pressure drops low. Although it's tempting to oversize inlets for sound, this can easily cause control problems at turndown. I generally don't recommend trying to control less than 400 feet per minute in my inlet duct, so a 2,000 foot per minute maximum velocity gives me a very comfortable 80% turndown. Besides control problems, oversized inlets can also cause noise problems. Selection software can predict noise levels at maximum flow based on inlet velocity and pressure, but oversized inlets can result in air squeaking around damper seals at minimum flow. This results in pure tone noise. Since the noise created is dependent on pressure, 
the condition of the damper seals, and the roundness of the duct, this is a sound that cannot be predicted by any manufacturer's catalog or software. As far as discharge duct work, I like to think of boxes as devices that reduce velocity by 50 percent. If you have 2,000 feet per minute going in, you shouldn't have more than 1,000 feet per minute coming out. Discharge ductwork should therefore be sized for no more than 1,000 feet per minute. In cases where grills will be tapped directly into the sides of the discharge duct, I would design for no more than 800 feet per minute to prevent the possibility of room air being induced into the first few grills. Now let's look at coils. Since we're looking at coils for single duct boxes, these are typically reheat coils. They're usually supplied with 55 degree air. It's important to understand that the heating flow rate on a single duct box is probably not the same as the minimum flow rate. If our maximum flow is the cooling design CFM, our minimum flow is our ventilation CFM, and our heating flow is probably about 50% of our cooling design CFM. That's because we know that it typically takes twice as much air to cool a room as it does to heat a room. We certainly wouldn't want to ventilate a room at our heating CFM because that would unnecessarily subcool the room and we would then waste energy heating it back up. With today's digital and analog electronic controls, it's easy to control these three flow rates. Water coils are not intended to be used with steam, so our maximum entering water temperature will be 200 degrees Fahrenheit. For many years, the standard supply water temperature was 180 degrees Fahrenheit, but green building initiatives and the latest condensing boilers are dropping water temperatures as low as 120 degrees. Water from geothermal sources could even be lower. According to ASHRAE, discharge temperatures from overhead diffusers should never be more than 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the desired room temperature for good room air mixing and thermal comfort. So if we wanted a 75 degree room temperature, we should limit our discharge temperature to 90 degrees. If we assume 55 degree supply air, then we would likewise limit the temperature rise through our coil to 35 degrees. This means that we should have at least 27 CFM per MBH to limit our discharge temperature. In hot water coils, it's important to avoid low water flow. If water moves too slowly through a coil, it can go from a desired turbulent flow to a less efficient laminar flow. It's much better to move water more quickly through a single row coil than to move it too slowly through a multi-row coil. When selecting electric coils, you'll likely have a choice between staged coils and SCR coils. Stage coils split the total heat capacity in anywhere from one to three equal stages, whereas SCR coils modulate the heat capacity from zero to 100 percent. Modern SCR heaters provide extended service life and improved reliability through the use of solid state relays fired by digital control logic. Although UL sets a maximum discharge temperature of 120 degrees on all electric duct heaters, we should observe the same ASHRAE guidelines for overhead heating. Assuming 55 degree supply air, we should have at least 90 CFM per kilowatt during the heating mode. So now let's look at how we do a selection on a single duct VAV box. First of all, we open our, our team selection program, and I'm often working in quick select. Over here we have our choice of uh, terminal unit and we're going to select a single duct. So I click on there and double click. And now we have our choice of controls. Uh, we'll just uh, start out here with a DESV, digital control. Okay, so we've got our input screen. Let's say we want to have a design uh, airflow of 700 CFM. And we know our minimum flow is usually going to be 20 to 25 percent, so we could guess that that's going to be about 175 CFM. Then our inlet static pressure, that's our system static pressure being controlled by our air handler. And you'll see it defaults to one inch of static pressure, which is pretty normal for a single duct VAV. Uh, we could raise that if we wanted to, but I'll just go ahead and leave it at one inch. 
our downstream static pressure defaults to a quarter inch, which is a, a good conservative number to use for making selections. This is the downstream static pressure that's being caused by the discharge duct work, uh, takeoffs, balancing dampers, flex duct, and diffusers. Uh, next we have our choice of whether or not we want an attenuator on the box. We can select yes or no there. Now an attenuator on a single duct VAV box is nothing more than an extension that's made to the rectangular casing. In our case it's a 24 inch longer extension and that just exposes the airstream to 24 inches of lined duct. Now the amount of attenuation that we will achieve with an, an optional attenuator is going to largely be determined by the type of lining we select in the box. And you can see here that we've got a number of different linings we could select. We could select um, the half inch uh, natural fiber. We could go with the half inch fiberglass. We could go with the one inch natural fiber. We could go with the one inch fiberglass. We could do the Sterilock, which is the foil covered critical environment uh, liner. Or we could go with Ultralock. That's dual wall construction. Uh, we've also got an option here for fiber free. That's our engineered polymer foam liner. Let's just say we're going to stay with our standard half inch fiberglass and we're going to go ahead and make a selection. We hit calculate and here's our result. You can see that it's giving us an 8 inch inlet duct. That's for 700 CFM. That follows my rule for trying to keep the uh, maximum in inlet velocity as close to 2,000 feet per minute as possible. You also see here that the minimum pressure requirement is 0.02 inches. That's the kind of low pressure requirement that you get with a basic single duct assembly because of the static pressure regain that we have inside the cabinet. You also see that the program gives us our radiated sound power levels and our discharge uh, sound power levels. We also get our room sound pressure levels and the calculated radiated noise criteria or NC level. You can see here that it's giving us an NC level of 24 for radiated sound and coincidentally an NC 24 for discharge sound. But let's say we wanted to go ahead and add a coil to this box. We could go up here to our heating coil and we could select a hot water coil. Now if we go over to our edit screen, our edit screen pops up and it gives us our choice of six different analysis methods. So we give uh, six different uh, uh, ways of selecting the box based on our known parameters. It just so happens that I'm usually trying to match somebody else's schedule so I, I tend to go for method six which is called the straight calculation. In this selection we input our maximum GPMs. This is the maximum amount of water flow that we're going to have, our gallons per minute. If I put in three GPMs, uh, it defaults to an inlet water temperature of 180 degrees. It also um, defaults to a 55 degree entering air temperature from our air handler, which is conventional. Now down here you might notice that our heating flow rate defaults to the same number that we input for our minimum flow rate. But that's not really going to be right for heating because we know it takes generally takes uh, twice as many CFM to cool a room as it does to heat a room. So if I have to take a guess here, I would say I need more than 175 CFM. I need more like 350 CFM so I can bump up my heating flow rate. Now my box is going to modulate from a cooling design flow of 700 CFM down to a ventilation flow of 175 CFM and then just before it turns on the heat it's going to open back up to a heating flow rate of 350 CFM. Now we'll go ahead and start out with a one row coil. You know one of the things that I see about uh, coil selection is that many people make it more complicated than it really needs to be. Oftentimes we get more information from our engineers than we actually need to make a selection. They, they in fact try to give us too, too much information and fill in all the blanks. Really what we're trying to do here is determine how many rows we need on our coil. Uh, most manufacturers offer a one, a two, a three, or a four row coil. But many engineers don't want to see more than a two row coil on a box. So in that case we're really only trying to figure out whether we need a one row coil or a two row coil. So the idea here is to make a selection and see if we can meet or exceed the engineer's desired heat capacity or leaving air temperature uh, with a minimal number of rows. Now if we go ahead and make a selection and say accept and uh, accept a couple other things here. 
Then it comes back up to our unit size 8. Now you'll notice that the minimum pressure requirement went up a great deal when we added that coil. It went from being 0.02 inches for the basic unit to 0.21 inches for the basic unit plus water coil. Another strange thing happens when you add a water coil. The box actually gets quieter. You'll notice the radiated sound level went from NC24 down to NC23, and the discharge sound went from NC24 down to NC21. And that's because we're adding pressure drop after the damper. That allows the damper to open more for a given flow rate, and that reduces our sound level by reducing our damper noise. We can also look at the heat results. And when we look at the heat results, You'll see that for our heating flow rate of 350 CFM in a one row coil, we get 13.1 MBH. That's 13,100 BTUs per hour. And that's at 3 gallons per minute of water flow. It gives us a leaving air temperature of 90 degrees and an entering air temperature of 55 degrees. Now a 90 degree leaving air temperature is as hot as we would ever want to discharge our air from a ceiling diffuser. Um, if we were doing slot diffusers along cold glass, we would probably want to drop that temperature even more. Uh, sometimes there's a tendency to try to raise the temperature in a situation like that, but that really works against you. For long expanses of glass from slot diffusers, we generally recommend anywhere from 82 to 85 degrees. That allows the air to travel further down the glass to give us better coverage. You'll also see that the program gives us our leaving water temperature is 171 degrees. It gives us a water pressure drop of 5.1 feet, and it gives us an air pressure drop for the coil only at design flow of 0.19 inches. Now let's go and look and see what happens when we add an electric coil. So we go back up, we click, click on electric coil, we come over and now we've got our electric coil input screen. We need to input our, our voltage and phase. We can click up here and we could select, for instance, uh, a 277 volt single phase coil. Uh, you'll notice over here, on the, over here on the screen that the heating flow rate defaulted back to our 175 uh, CFM minimum flow. And of course, that's not going to be enough for doing electric heat. We know we want to have 50% of the maximum is a good starting point. So we'll go ahead and put in 350 CFM. And uh, then we, we, we have our choice of whether we want to have a one stage, a two stage, or a three stage heater. Um, now, for small heaters, you typically uh, can get good control with only one stage. Uh, three stages are really um, not used very often these days. That was more popular when pneumatic controls were being used, when you had to break the heat capacity into more steps to get accurate temperature control. F with digital controls or analog electronic controls, it's possible to get very accurate control with a fewer number of stages. These days, it's, it's uh, pretty rare to see more than two stage heaters being used. Now, if somebody, sometimes we, Sometimes we're asked if we can build a, a 10 stage heater and uh, that's really totally impractical because that would require 10 separate elements and all the controls to operate each of those elements. When situations like that come up, that's when it's best to suggest an SCR controlled heater. An SCR heater is going to give us the same functionality that we would get from an infinite number of uh, stages of heat. Um, so that's going to give us the ultimate in control there. Now one thing I like to do, this is just has to do with our selection software, I like to take the coil minimum leaving air temperature, which defaults to 85 degrees, and drop it down to 55 degrees because I don't like it when it interferes with my selections. And let's say we, we put in um, a requirement for 3 kilowatts. We could either let it calculate the number of kilowatts we need or we could just input the number of kilowatts. Then we say accept. We say calculate, we pull up our selection, it comes back to a size 8 unit. You'll notice our minimum pressure dropped uh, from that, I believe it was 0.21 with the water coil, back down to 0.04. So it, it has a little more pressure drop than the 
bare basic unit, but, but an electric coil has not nearly the pressure drop of a water coil. You'll see our radiated sound level went back to 24 where we started. Our discharge sound stayed down at 21 because the casing that we use for the electric coil also acts as a sound attenuator. Now if we look at the heat results, you'll see here that uh, we've got a leaving air temperature of 82. So when I guessed it, uh, at a design uh, kilowatt of three, I guess I was kind of low there. But this might be a good selection if we were supplying air to linear diffusers along an expanse of glass. So now that we've, we've looked at a single duct selection, let's look at dual duct boxes. Where do you find dual duct boxes? They're usually found in university buildings, hospitals, and university hospitals. These units are supplied with hot and cold air and can be used in non-mixing or mixing applications. They can also provide variable volume or constant volume airflow to the spaces they serve. Dual duct boxes without mixing chambers should only be used in non-mixing applications. These units would provide cooling or heating, but not at the same time. A mixing chamber is absolutely necessary for blending hot and cold air streams together. The standard mixing ratio for dual duct boxes is a 1 in 10 ratio, meaning that for every 10 degrees of difference in the hot and cold supply temperatures, there will be no more than 1 degree of temperature variation at the discharge duct. High mixing boxes are also available and they provide 1 in 20 mixing, so you could say they blend twice as well. With the high cost of operating dual duct systems, the market for dual duct boxes is somewhat limited. There is, however, renewed interest in dual duct boxes for mixing conditioned air with air from dedicated outdoor air systems. In an application like this, an optional water coil at the discharge of the unit could be used for heating without the need to actually reheat. There are many terminal unit lining options available for manufacturers. Traditional or standard lining materials usually involve fiberglass products. All manufacturers offer half-inch and one-inch dual-density fiberglass. This material has an R value of 1.9 or 3.9 in the most common thicknesses. Fiberglass has good acoustical properties along with good insulating properties, but many system designers are trying to get away from exposed fiberglass. For critical environment applications such as hospital operating rooms or laboratories, Fiberglass covered with foil or dual wall construction is needed to keep any stray fibers out of the airstream. Luckily for engineers who want to avoid using fiberglass in any form, there are new materials that have all the good properties of fiberglass without any of the potential problems. Engineered polymer foam is available in several thicknesses. It contains an antimicrobial agent to resist mold growth. It also absorbs no moisture and has a cleanable surface. There are also natural fiber linings available in multiple thicknesses with either cloth or foil facing. It's important to keep in mind that the lining material choice could have either a positive or negative impact on the acoustical performance of various types of terminal units. As a general rule, the harder the facing is on a liner, the less sound it will absorb. This can increase the transmission loss through the casing resulting in lower radiated sound levels but it can also result in higher discharge sound levels. Softer linings are not as effective for blocking noise, but can provide somewhat lower discharge sound levels. Terminal unit controls have come a long way since the 1980s when I first joined this industry. Back then all we had were pneumatic controls and everybody knew how to work with them. We probably provide more technical service now than we did back then because they are rarely used in new buildings. These days pneumatic controls are usually only supplied on boxes being used to remodel or finish out buildings with existing pneumatic systems. Analog electronic controls are often an excellent choice for small buildings or situations where there's no desire to network or communicate with the controls. Analog controls can provide excellent airflow and temperature control and can also be balanced using nothing more than a voltmeter and a screwdriver. Any new construction or large building is going to require digital electronic controls. In order to achieve lead points for building control and energy optimization, digital controls are almost always going to be needed. Digital controls use the latest PID control algorithms to provide excellent airflow and temperature control. They are usually networked and become part of the building management system. 
For many years, the industry has been moving towards interoperability between control devices. BACnet compliant systems are rapidly taking over the building controls industry. So now let's look at a dual duct selection using selection software. First of all, I come over and select a dual duct. I double click. Now we've got our choice of a, uh, we've got a lot of different models here. Um, we've got units with and without mixing attenuators. We'll go ahead and do one with a mixing attenuator. And let's say we uh, have a cooling design airflow of 800 CFM and a heating design flow of 400 CFM and we have a minimum cooling requirement of uh, let's say 200 CFM and we're not going to put in a minimum heating requirement because we don't ever want to uh, heat during the cooling mode. Our system static pressure defaults to one inch um, that, that's a pretty reasonable choice there. That would work with uh, most dual duct applications. And then our downstream static pressure again defaults to 0.25 inches, which is a good conservative number to represent the pressure drop after the box. The only reason why we might want to raise uh, the 0.25 to a higher value would be the dual duct boxes were often used in hospitals and uh, we might uh, have HEPA filters downstream from the unit. So we may in some applications have to raise that above a quarter of an inch. Once again we have our options for different lining materials to go in the box. Uh, let's just uh, say we're going to go ahead and leave it with the fiberglass lining and we'll go over here and make a selection. And you'll see here that uh, the unit came up with mismatched inlets. And that's not unusual when you have dual duct boxes in a variable volume application. We know that we need more air for cooling than we need for heating, so it only makes sense that the hot duct is smaller than the cold duct. You'll see here we have a minimum pressure requirement of 0.71. That's a lot higher than you'll find with a single duct VAV box, and that's because dual duct boxes with mixing chambers are designed to blend hot and cold air together. Those two air streams will not blend together by themselves, so this box has to have some mixing baffles, sometimes some perforated plates. It has to have some way of generating some turbulence to get that hot and cold air to mix together. Now sound-wise, our radiated sound level is 21, that's NC21, and our discharge sound level is NC18. Those are both low sound levels. Um, dual duct boxes are typically used in hospitals and laboratories, and uh, these kind of sound levels are so low that they would be good enough to go into a conference room in a, in a standard office building. So these sorts of sound levels would definitely be acceptable in a healthcare application. Now let's look at fan-powered units. Fan-powered terminal units are available in two basic types. They're typically referred to as series or parallel fan units. There are other subcategories available for most manufacturers including quiet, ultra-quiet, low-profile, and also units designed for underfloor applications. The unit fan in a fan-powered terminal is used to draw return air to be used as free heat and delivered back to the space. Like single duct boxes, fan boxes serving perimeter zones typically include reheat. In a series fan unit, cold primary air is delivered by an air handler to the VAV inlet. The unit fan runs continuously to deliver a constant volume of mixed air to the room. The primary inlet regulates the amount of cooling and makeup air is pulled into the induction port. The function and layout of a parallel unit is very different. In the cooling mode, the unit fan is off and the VAV inlet supplies cold air to the space just like a single duct box. When less cooling is required, the primary damper closes until it eventually reaches its minimum flow limit. If the room temperature continues to drop, the unit fan switches on to pull warm air and blow it out to the room. If more heat is required, then a hot water coil or electric coil is used to warm up the space. There are a couple of design differences between these units. The blower in a series fan box must be sized larger to handle the design cooling airflow to the room, while the blower in a parallel box handles only the lower heating flow rate. So the series blower is typically twice as big. Since the parallel fan is off during the cooling mode, a backdraft damper is generally necessary to prevent the loss of primary air to the ceiling plenum. 
Since the backdraft damper is typically gravity operated and must move freely, it can become a point of leakage in a parallel fan box. There are also differences in the operating characteristics of these two types of boxes. So now let's make a selection on a series fan powered terminal. We go over here and click on fan powered terminals and we once again have our choice of controls. Let's just pick a DDC control and now we've got all these different models to choose from. Well a series fan powered box we, we might want to check this model and uh, first of all we input our design airflow. Let's say that's going to be a thousand CFM and our fan design airflow is also going to uh, default to the same number that we put in as our design airflow for our inlet duct and that's because generally speaking the fan flow should match the uh, primary cooling uh, maximum flow. There are some situations in low temperature systems where we might want to pull more air through the fan than we provide through the primary inlet but in most systems we want those two numbers to match. Now we come down here to put in our minimum flow and we know that's going to be 20 to 25 percent of our maximum flow so we'll input 250 CFM. Now when we look at our system static pressure, our pressure provided by our fan system, the program defaulted to one inch of static pressure but we know that series fan powered boxes actually act as a booster for our fan system. So I see many people using series fan powered boxes with systems running down uh, as low as half an inch. So um, we'll go ahead and drop that down to half an inch. I'm also going to leave the uh, discharge static pressure at a quarter inch which is kind of the industry standard even though I know a lot of these uh, systems run at uh, much lower discharge static pressures. That's a good conservative number uh, for selecting our blower. Now we have our choice of whether we want to have a um, standard PSC motor or the optional ECM. We'll go ahead and make this selection using the standard motor. Um, we also have a choice here on whether we want to put a noise reduction package on the unit or go with the standard unit. For now let's just go with the standard package. There's also an option here for an air filter. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what the purpose is of this air filter. Um, filters are generally offered by manufacturers as construction filters. That means the purpose of the filter is to protect the motor and blower assembly from dust contamination during construction. If the boxes are going to be run during construction to provide temporary ventilation, we want to make sure that uh, any dust, especially from any drywall work being done, doesn't get drawn into the fan boxes. That drywall dust can deposit unevenly on the blower wheel and knock it out of balance, but what's worse, it can also create, uh, if it creates a layer of dust on the outside of a permanently lubricated fan motor, it can actually wick the lubrication out of the bearings. So to avoid permanent damage to our product, it's usually a good insurance policy to order it with the optional construction filter. I should also point out that when the boxes are commissioned and balanced, it's traditional to to remove this filter and throw it away. There, there's generally no need to replace it. Once again we have our lining options we can select but we'll go ahead and leave this with a standard lining. Now if we make our selection we tell it to calculate. It selects a unit size C with a 10 inch inlet. I like to use a 10 inch inlet for a thousand CFM so that uh, follows my rule for not exceeding a 2000 foot per minute inlet velocity. You can see the minimum pressure requirement here for 1000 CFM is very low. It's only 0.13 inches. We've got our primary plus radiated sound power levels. We've also got our fan only radiated sound levels. And over here we have our fan plus primary discharge sound levels as well as our fan only discharge sound levels. Now when you look at the NC levels on this unit, you'll see that the radiated NC level is 34 and the discharge uh, sound level is uh, 29. Now I don't know how that uh, might sound to you. Uh, do you think uh, NC 34 is very quiet? Well in a standard office building NC 34 might be quiet enough to go over a private office which is usually specified not to exceed NC 35. 
Um, it's probably a little too loud to go over a typical conference room where NC levels are usually specified not to exceed NC30. We could definitely put it over an open office area where uh, people might be working in cubicles where the sound level is usually specified to be as close to NC40 as possible. Um, but let's say that we wanted to put this unit over um, a sound sensitive area like a conference room. This NC34 is probably going to be too loud, but we might want to go up and see what happens when we take and add a sound reduction package. So when we drop in this uh, sound package and tell it to recalculate, you can see that our radiated sound level of NC34 just dropped to an NC level of 27. So it shows that by adding the sound package to the basic unit, we could drop our radiated sound level by 7 NC points. That's pretty significant. There's some other strategies we can use. If we go up and take the sound package back off, and let's say we go down here and look at our linings, um, most selection software automatically uh, readjusts the sound performance based on the type of lining material that you select. We, our original selection was our standard half inch fiberglass, but let's say we go in and select um, a, a one inch thick liner with a soft facing on it like our natural cotton liner and we go in and we tell it to make a selection with that one inch liner you can see that the sound level went from a radiated sound level of NC34 down to an NC31 so that actually dropped three NC points off our radiated sound that's pretty significant um, I usually don't expect to see more than a one or two NC point drop going from a half inch thick soft face liner to a one inch liner. Now let's go up here and see what happens with some other liners. If we uh, go back to our lining selection and we pick something like a foil covered uh, 13 16 inch liner, tell it to calculate and select look what our radiated sound level went to. It went from down there at 31 with a one inch soft liner to a 40 with a foil covered liner. Now I should point out that the harder the facing is on a uh, liner in a fan powered product, um, the, the, the less I believe the results that you get from selection software and that's because um, the more the transmission loss increases through the casing of a fan powered box, the more directional the sound is coming out of the induction port. And um, selection software that's based on uh, the industry standard, which is AHRI standard 885, tends to overstate the sound levels that are going to result. That's because it doesn't take into account directionality on sound. Um, I usually recommend when you start getting into liners um, like dual wall linings and foil covered linings, I think the safest thing to do is actually mock up those sound results in a laboratory rather than rely on manufacturer's software. Um, so this is, you know, following industry rules, this is what it predicts, but I wouldn't necessarily believe it. Series fan terminals have lower system pressure requirements because the air handler only delivers air to the unit and the unit fan moves the air the rest of the way to the room. The fan runs to provide constant volume resulting in more air changes and higher occupant comfort. Since the fan isn't cycling on and off, it provides a constant background sound level to the space. These are all advantages provided by series fan boxes. Parallel fan terminals have higher system pressure requirements because the air handler moves design air all the way to the room just like a single duct box. In fact, the cabinet designs of most parallel fan boxes require more system pressure than single duct VAV boxes. The higher the pressure drop is downstream from a parallel box, the higher the leakage will be through the backdraft damper. Since the air volume on the diffusers may vary during cooling and suddenly increase whenever the fan switches on for heating, extra care must be taken when selecting diffusers. The modulating airflow and unit fan cycling can result in significant sound level changes. These are all disadvantages of parallel fan boxes. When selecting fan powered units, you'll have a choice between two different types of fan motors. 
The standard permanent split capacitor, or PSC motor, has been around for many years, but the newer electronically commutated ECM motor is taking over the market. ECMs have a higher initial cost, but provide many benefits for the building owner. First, let's look at the old technology. PSC motors are sleeve bearing motors. Although they're classified as high efficiency motors, that's really only when compared to other induction type motors like shaded pole motors. The efficiency of a PSC motor is 20 to 60 percent depending on the operating condition. When properly sized and applied, they typically last 10 to 12 years. They last longer and run cooler when working hard and operating at higher speeds. The common means of speed adjustment for a PSC motor is a silicon controlled rectifier or SCR. This is a device that takes in smooth AC sine wave power and as you turn it down it notches and distorts the wave to reduce the available power to the motor. This not only reduces the speed of the motor but it also makes the motor run hotter and can also make it hum. SCRs are best used for trimming the speed of a PSC motor rather than chopping it. Oversized PSC motors running at low speeds tend to overheat and fail prematurely. Now let's look at the newer technology. ECMs use ball bearings and include a programmable controller. Programming coefficients are developed by each terminal unit manufacturer to optimize the operation of the ECM in each of their applications. Although these motors are supplied with AC power, they internally rectify this and operate on DC power. These are smart motors that can be programmed to supply constant air volume despite changes in external pressure. They are about 70% efficient over their entire operating range with an estimated service life of 20 to 30 years. Speed adjustment is made by means of a pulse width modulated or PWM input signal. Most manufacturers offer the option of a manually adjusted PWM speed control or a model that can accept a 0 to 10 volt DC input signal from a digital controller. So you can see why ECMs are taking over. Building owners looking to save on operating and maintenance costs want ECMs. ECMs are already a code requirement in the states of Washington and California as well as the city of Houston. As industry works to further reduce energy usage in all types of buildings, ECM motors become an obvious choice. Now let's look at fan selection. This is a typical fan curve for a PSC motor. It provides the manufacturer's recommended operating range of CFM versus external static pressure. As external pressure increases, the CFM delivery decreases. The top curve shows the maximum air delivery, and other curves describe the effects of one row and two row water coils. The bottom curve describes the minimum recommended operating point. Although most designers select fan powered units for a quarter inch of discharge pressure, actual operating conditions can be much lower. Care must be taken to ensure that any boxes selected near the minimum curve won't end up operating below the curve under actual job site conditions. For longer life and highest efficiency, PSC motors should be selected near the upper curves if at all possible. ECM curves look very different from PSC curves. As you can see from this example, ECM curves tend to be very flat over the recommended operating range. This is because they're programmed to automatically compensate for changes in external pressure. Of course, at some point as the pressure rises, the ECM runs out of horsepower and the curves nose over. You might also notice that the operating range of the ECM is wider than the PSC motor. This is because the ball bearings and PWM speed control allow the ECM to run at slower speeds with no adverse effect on service life. Now let's go ahead and make a selection on a parallel fan powered terminal. So if we select on our our fan powered unit. We go to digital control and we select one of our parallel units. Um, here's one that ends in a P, that's parallel. We input our design primary airflow. Let's say that's going to be a thousand CFM. We put in our design fan airflow and we know that's usually going to be about 50 percent of our cooling design so we put in 500 CFM for our fan. Then we put in our minimum flow, which is usually 20 to 25 percent, we could say 200 CFM. Um, we're probably going to want to leave our inlet static pressure at one inch for a parallel box because remember the air handler 
when it's feeding a parallel box, has to move the air all the way to the room. So we're back from, from the lower pressure we could have with a series fan box to a higher pressure that we would need for a parallel fan box. We'll go ahead and leave our downstream static pressure at 0.25 inches. And once again, we have our choice of either a standard or an ECM motor. Let's go ahead and pick an ECM motor this time. Uh, we've also got our option for whether we want a filter on the unit and we've got those same lining options that we've seen all along. Now if we go ahead and calculate, you'll see that the selection that came up is a unit size 4 with a 10 inch inlet. You'll see the minimum pressure is quite a bit higher than a, than a uh, series fan powered box here. For a parallel it's .22 inches. Once again we have our radiated sound power, we have our, um, our room sound pressure levels, we have our radiated uh, NC level of 32, and we have our discharge NC level of 20. Now if we wanted to look in and see what difference it makes when we add a coil to this unit, we can go over here and select a water coil and hit our edit screen. Once again we have our choice of analysis methods. I'm going to go with the straight calculation. We default to an entering water temperature of 180 degrees. We have uh, an entering air temperature of 55 degrees. Um, it's, uh, our minimum primary flow is 200 CFM. Our coil is going to be positioned on the induction port of this unit. That's a little different. We do something a little different for parallel boxes. Uh, the preferred position for a hot water reheat coil on a parallel box is on the induction port. Um, on a series box it always goes on the discharge of the unit. It's a little bit more efficient to pull the plenum air through the coil and then over the blower rather than push our cooling through that uh, coil on the discharge of the unit. But one thing that we, uh, kind of the downside to doing it this way is we're somewhat limited on the amount of heat we can have in the coil because we think that if our uh, leaving air temperature on our coil exceeds 130 degrees, we might overheat our fan uh, motor. So that's why our selection program looks at the, at the leaving air temperature to make sure it doesn't go over 130 degrees. We can input our maximum gallons per minute. Let's say we put in three gallons per minute and we have a one row coil. Then we can go ahead and hit accept and accept and calculate. And once again, we're back to our unit size 4 with a 10-inch inlet. Uh, we can look at our heat results. We have a one-row coil with 20 MBH. That's at 3 GPM. We got a box leaving air temperature of 89, which is just one degree below uh, the maximum we'd ever want to see, which is 90 degrees. Uh, we've got our entering air temperature going into our coil at 65. That's the mixture of return air from the plenum plus the cold air from the primary. We have our leaving water temperature at 166.7 degrees. We have our water pressure drop at 1.9 feet and the air pressure drop through our coil is 0.03 inches. So that's how we would do a parallel selection. Do we have any questions?